Jim Laird. I love talking about nutrition, about about health. Many of you know my story, how I was up, uh, you know, well over 340 pounds. I had to lose the weight. Doctor gave me an ultimatum to see my daughter. Jim is a uh, incredible history. Um, wait till you find out what happens after just getting a, a pedicure, uh, a request from his girlfriend. But he had to do a lot of trauma. He was a coach. He was working from 5 a.m. till you know 12 hours a day, and a series of things happened. And now he's in Nicaragua where he's opening up a gym, but he helps people with just nutrition and health and exercise. We talk about the five things needed to, you know, to lose weight, to lose fat without exercising. Um, light, just sunlight in the morning. We hear about it. We know how important it is. Uh, Jim's very, very, um, the, the passion, and you could just tell he's so determined. And I ask him what motivates him and impact on helping people, but just the different ways, just the simple things we can do to get healthy. Uh, there's so many ways, but it's a great conversation Conversation with uh, Jim Laird, really, really passionate man. I, I share his enthusiasm and I, I love his message. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins, and here's my 45 second introduction. After starting my business in the 90s, I started developing poor habits of eating in my diet because I was working way too much. Before you know it, I found myself 340 pounds. The doctor told me if I don't lose the weight, I'm not going to see my daughter graduate. Took the next seven months, lost 130 pounds. People think there's some secret. Ask me, how'd you lose that weight? Like there's some secret. There is no secret. How'd I lose the weight? Just one word, discipline. I've had other successes in life and I attribute them all to discipline. Now I'm not the king of discipline, but I believe that it can help all of us. Friends, colleagues convinced me to start a podcast. The podcast mission, how do we better ourselves and society? I talk to interesting people in health, fitness, sport, wellness, business, technology, science, art, and culture. And I eventually ask them how discipline plays a role in their life. Podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Definitely will. Jim Laird, thanks so much for your time. I'm very excited to talk to you. How has light saved your life, Jim? Well, <clears throat> I had a health challenge around 2008, 2009. I had alternative colitis and I made some lifestyle changes. Um, I was working too much, working too hard. A mm. lot of it was to manage anger and hatred I'd had from my childhood. Hmm. And I wasn't taking enough time to shut off. And I got that fixed through dietary change, lifestyle change, learning how to relax, valuing sleep. Uh, but then about 10 years later, I had another health challenge. <clears throat> I was dating a lady and um, she wasn't very happy with the condition of my feet. And because, uh, you know, I spent all day in a gym, you know, and um, she's like, you got to get a pedicure. I was like, OK, I'll get a pedicure. Four or five days later, I'm in the emergency room. They're preparing my leg for amputation. Oh. <clears throat> Yeah, I had a staph infection, and luckily they were able to get it under control with antibiotics. And they told me when I left, they said, this is going to come back, but it's not going to be like in your leg. It's going to be full body. It's going to feel like you've got a, like a really bad cold or a fever, like, a, like, your, like the flu, but no respiratory symptoms. So this started coming back. You know, I'd have to go to the emergency room. My, my fever would go ridiculously, you know, 103, 104. Wow. Um, so I would go like basically go septic and I have to be on IV antibiotics. After this happened time and time again, every three or four months, this would happen. Jeez. I'm like, the antibiotics are just not working as well as they used to. And I'm thinking like, okay, um, what do I do? So I ran into a guy named Dr. Jack Cruz is a fairly controversial guy as a neurosurgeon. And I, I heard him speak and he, he made a lot of people upset. Uh, he told people that uh, eating a banana in New York in the wintertime was was stupid, right? So it's kind of like a mismatch, right? Hmm. And he got a lot of people really upset. So I was like, I'd, get to, I'd got to get to know this guy. So I became kind of friends with him. I got part of his group, his members group, which is actually how I met my, the person I work with now, Dr. Stillman. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> he's like, you know, I told him about what I had going on and he was like, so what do you do for a living? And I was like, well, I'm a coach. I get up at five o'clock in the morning. I work till about eight at night. Hmm. I was like, do you ever go outside? Like, when's the last time you saw a sunrise? And I was like, 
honestly, probably since I was a teenager. When I did go outside, I wore sunglasses. You know, I really didn't, I was pretty light sensitive. My eyes would water if I was in the sun. And he's like, dude, you're a freaking human zoo animal. You do realize the, the sun runs your immune system. Your immune system changes with the seasons. The sun runs your hormones, everything. He's like, dude, you got to get some light in your life. So I fired all my morning clients till like 10 o'clock. I've made a lot of people upset. And I started following his advice. And sure enough, I haven't had, I've had a little minor, minor hiccup since then, but nothing that couldn't be taken care of with, with some really simple things. I literally haven't had any major reoccurring infections in, since then. So wow. uh, I really, and then I started realizing like, <clears throat> here I am, I'm training people to get healthier, to lose weight, to, to improve performance. And they're spending 98% of their day indoors and I'm bringing them into an indoor gym. Mm. And I'm just like, you know, I didn't really feel good about that, you know? And so when COVID, they shut me down with COVID, after I got opened up from COVID, I had started looking in Florida, Mexico, looking at different places where I could open an outdoor gym. Kentucky's not a really great place for that. The winters are mm. just gross. Mm. And it's really hot and muggy in the summertime. And so I, I made some changes. I had the doors open. I changed some of the, I added a red light and some some uh, black bulbs to the ceiling to give it a little bit of UV light to make it a little more like sunshine. And I noticed a difference. And I started really using my platform to get people to walk outside several times a day. But I'm like, I, I felt like a hypocrite. So after, um, after COVID, I sold my gym and I moved to Florida and started working with Dr. Stillman online and brought, you know, coaching into his medical practice. And we have a medical practice and a coaching program. Um, then I was like, okay, so I've looked around in Florida. There's, you know, the, the cost of opening something is ridiculous, you know, oh, is it? Oh, when you try to have a, like a decent property in Florida and open a gym, like we're talking lots of money. <clears throat> looked at Mexico. It was still, you know, Mexico is better, but it was still kind of pricey if you're, especially if you're around like Tulum or any of the popular areas. And then Nicaragua kind of fell onto my map. And then I ended up uh, moving to Nicaragua last year. I drove down here from Florida with my dog and uh, I had a beach property picked out to, to basically develop my gym at, and it didn't work out. It just wasn't a good fit. So now I'm kind of hopping around Nicaragua, exploring, looking, I, I think I found a place now where I'm comfortable building something. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of how it, it like changed my life. And, and really the first thing I talk to people about is like, how much time are you indoors versus outdoors? And like, you look at Europe, um, Europeans don't have, I mean, they're getting worse because of the, the level of, um, how much they, you know, they're, the more we, we go towards a Western model, the more time you spend indoors. Mm. I think the worst people struggle with anxiety, depression, you know, the screen time. You know, I do all my interviews outside here. It's one of the reasons I moved here. I have a beautiful patio that I, I do all my interviews outdoors. And the only time I'm really inside is when I sleep and um, really mm. mindful of artificial light. And so, um, yeah, here I'm in Nicaragua. And um, it was nice. Nicaragua is great because the, the cost of living is low. I can manage my workload. I don't have to work quite as hard as I would in the U.S. and get to have a much higher quality of life. Jim, you mentioned that you had a pedicure and then you just kind of jumped to the infection. I, something happened during that pedicure? Yeah, I got an infection from the pedicure. From the pedicure, you got an mm -hmm. infection that, that affected yeah. you for months and years? Decades, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people get, a lot of women will shave their legs before they go in and get a pedicure and they put their feet in the, <clears throat> in the, in the, um, you know, in the water That's and they get a low, uh, underlying low lying. So you can look it up and read about it, but they get a low level staph infection that ends up with them having a heart attack, like, you know, 15, 20 years later. I, Jeez. they shouldn't have done the pedicure on me. I had cracks in my feet. It was bad. And then they started using these really aggressive tools on my feet. And so <clears throat> the quantum, theory behind that would be my redox potential was just my body's ability to heal and regenerate itself. I call it like a stress bathtub. When the bathtub overflows, you know, you end up getting whatever disease or whatever issue. Hmm. And, um, you know, my body was just not in a good place because of the amount of time I was spending indoors and that pedicure, you know, I ended up getting a staph infection from it. And so it, it literally within a few days, my leg had swollen up 
and uh, I was limping around in the gym and <clears throat> one of the, one of the ladies who's an MD was like, what's wrong? And I was wearing long pants. I never wear long pants. And, um, uh, she was like, what's wrong with Jim? And the lady's like, he's got some sort of weird thing going on with his leg. And she's like, I want to see your leg. And I'm like, really? So I pull my pant leg up and she literally turned white. And she like ran out the door, got on the phone. <clears throat> she's like, you're going to the infectious disease center down the street where I work right now. And so wow. I got there and you know, when they're pulling the interns in to like, take a look at you, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of, kind of significant. Hmm. Hmm. I also heard you talk about you, you got like a CAT scan and they saw this trauma in your head. Yeah, no, I didn't get a CAT scan. <clears throat> this was, a, excuse me. <clears throat> um, this was after a car wreck I had in Florida. Right. And uh, I was rear ended uh, by a guy who uh, wasn't paying attention. And I was having a hard time getting my sleep back online. So I did something called neurofeedback um, where they put electrodes on your brain and they essentially mm. mapped your brain. And um, they looked at it. The scan it took me like eight or 10 attempts to actually do the test because you have to sit and you have to keep your eyes closed for like a minute. And then you have to sit and like just stare at the wall and not blink much. And I was blinking like crazy and I was twitching and, Finally, I, I got a reading and they were like, man, you've got this big hot spot back here. And, you know, like we got to deal with this. They, they were like, that's that's basically the area of the brain that's lit up. That's like trauma related. And they're like, what happened was, is your your accident, like you kind of impaired your ability to deal with this stuff. <laughs> and so so your body's kind of like. You have ability to deal with certain things, and once the body kind of gets overwhelmed, it, it kind of loses the, and that's when you end up with problems. And and they were like, you know, you're not going to be able to sleep. You're not going to be able to get yourself in a better place until we start dealing with this. And so we started, I started doing EMDR therapy and I thought I'd forgiven people. And I thought I'd put that part of my life behind me, but I hadn't hmm. really. So we started doing EMDR and started reliving a lot of this stuff and processing it and dealing with it. And that's when, you know, I really started seeing significant improvements uh, in my ability to sleep and rest and, and shut my brain off. You know, your brain gets used to a certain pattern, so to speak, just kind of like movement. And it's like, I worked a lot with special forces guys. I did a lot of body bodyguard work in my early twenties and we'd be out somewhere and, you know, we'd be having coffee and these guys would be smoking two cigarettes and their foot would be going up and down. Mm, and mm, then mm. we'd go out somewhere and there'd be gunshots or there'd be some sort of like, you know, stressful situation all of a sudden these dudes are totally relaxed and they'd be like how's your family doing like you know what's going on and we're having a conversation while there's like all hell breaking loose and uh they just their their brain had been flipped their their brain gets so used to being in a stress state that that becomes their normal hmm. and so we do we use that tool a lot with clients in our practice because a lot of people their brain gets used to being in this like overdriven i i compare modern life to getting in your car turning it on, leaving it in park and revving the living daylights out of it all day, just revving wow. it to the red line. And you don't go anywhere, which modern life, we don't really do anything physically, um, which I think physical manual labor, low level manual labor, like people do here in Nicaragua every day is very few therapeutic to the human. Hmm. Uh, but this chronic mental stress, the, the, the flipping through the phones, the constant gaslighting, the constant emotional hmm stuff I, I think that's very detrimental to the human biology if you read by zebras don't get ulcers by dr sapolsky he goes into that how our stress response is you know obviously made for us to survive but it's not for meant for us to have that full stress response in traffic or watching you know netflix or whatever else and so we use that a lot in our practice with people that have a really hard time relaxing because when you're in this this revved up state, you know, you, oh, you breathe more and then you, you kind of get caught in this loop where you can't relax. Mm. And, and I think there's a, we have a chronic, we have a chronic, uh, what would be the word? We have a chronic like epidemic of people not being able to sit in silence and be calm and be bored. They always have to be entertained. They always have to be doing something, their brain. Mm. They, a lot of people can, I couldn't sit quietly cause I didn't want to deal with the stuff in my head. Mm. The stuff would bubble up and I'd, I'd get busy or I'd, you know, I'd go out with a girl like would, that probably wasn't a good fit for me, or I'd I'd always be doing something. I'd be working. I had to go to sleep exhausted because I just couldn't deal with silence. And now I make silence a, a big part of my life. I go out in the in the jungle here and I sit quietly and listen. I, I think there's you know it says in, in in Psalms, "Be still and know." 
I mean, even I'm not an ultra religious person, but you know, even Jesus, who is the you know the Son of God, would go out in, and most religious figures in history would go out into the wilderness by themselves, you know? So I think there's a huge part of getting into nature. We've shut nature out of our lives completely. Most people never spend any time in nature. I think that's a huge component to your mental health and well-being is being quiet in nature, listening to the birds. Like this morning we have howler monkeys here that wake us up every morning. Um, Like they make roosters look like amateurs. Um, So, so I go out and, and hang out with the howler monkeys and they run across my roof here occasionally. So. You have uh, on your social media, Jimmy, you have five tips to lose body fat without exercise. And your first one is that morning light, protein water slow down and then lights off. So Mm -hmm. let's talk about protein. So uh, what do you do for protein there in Nicaragua? Well, there's plenty of great options here. I, I don't know what they do to the chickens here, but they I, I was never really a big chicken fan in the United States, but the chicken here is so much better. Even the store-bought mm. stuff mm. is is amazing. So chicken, seafood, they have great beef here. I mean, there's no such thing. Most things here are naturally organic because they just can't afford the pesticides and all that stuff, mm. and, you know. And you see cows. Cows are literally walking down the street. They're, they're eating. They use the cows and then to eat the grass on the side of the road. I mean, it's huh. just, uh, I mean, yeah, you gotta be careful sometimes uh, when you're riding down the road, I, I ride a motorcycle here and, and, you know, the cows will sometimes get off their little ropes and things and, or they'll be marching a whole, you'd be driving down the highway and all of a sudden there's 30 cows that are marching a herd of cows down the road. <laughs> and these are not, these are not tiny little cows either. These are big, like muscular. They have, I don't know what the breed is here, but they're, they're, they're big and sturdy and they leave the horns on them. So, wouldn't be hmm. a good good idea to run into one of those. Hmm. So seafood, lean meats, chicken, fish. Um, that's generally and and the, the nice thing about most people, you know, they don't eat a lot of protein today, and you know, protein is important for appetite regulation. Um, it tends the more protein you eat, the less garbage you tend to eat because it kind of hmm. fills you up. Whereas the more processed food you eat, you kind of turn into this human vacuum cleaner. You do. Yeah. And then also, you know, we need muscle mass. Most people, I have what most people will consider an excessive amount of muscle mass because all the years of powerlifting, but most people need to maintain or build some muscle mass to help their metabolic rate, their overall metabolic health. You know, it helps regulate blood sugar. Um, and then most people don't think about the morning light's important for sleep, yes, uh, and getting your circadian rhythm set, your cortisol rhythm set. Um, but you know, if you don't have the amino acids and all the nutrients that you need to make the neurotransmitters and all the things that you need to go to sleep, you're, you're not going to sleep well. Mm. So we see a lot of people, that's why we usually, the first two are usually, particularly with women is get outside three times a day and up your protein. And that's usually where we like to add things at first where we try not to take things away. It's much easier to add stuff than take things away with people. And, um, we usually see that, you know, their sleep starts to improve. And then once the sleep improves. Then all of a sudden you've got less cravings, you're craving less alcohol, you're able to make better choices and getting people self-aware and present. Um, that makes a big difference because when you're you're sleep deprived and you're on a blood sugar roller coaster, it's very easy for you to become a human vacuum cleaner and forget that you ate a whole bag of chips or whatever else, you know. Mm-hmm. Where do you stand on eggs, Jim? Do you eat a lot of eggs there? Yes, I eat a lot of uh, huervos, huervos, that's what they call it here. (laughs) Huervos, yes, Spanish. I I love eggs. I think they're great. Uh, We we usually try and get people to do like maybe two eggs and add a little bit of whites, you know, buy a carton of whites and add the whites uh, so that we're not, you know, if you eat, you try try to get enough protein, you're trying to get 30 grams of protein, um, you know, you're having to eat like six or eight eggs and then you're just getting a boatload of fat too, so you know, fat's nothing wrong with fat, but we don't need to have like, you know, a fat bomb for breakfast. So I usually tell people like do two eggs, add some egg whites, peppers, spinach, mushrooms, you know, put salsa on it, put avocado on it, uh, guacamole, um, you know, and then, um, you know, add maybe a little bit of lean meat to it, you know, maybe some ground turkey, ground chicken, ground beef to that, you know, make a frittata type thing. Mm. That's usually the kind of advice we'll give people, but there are people that, you know, are, you know, allergic to eggs, but generally speaking, we recommend that. But I find that most of the food allergies, once you get outside, you get your circadian rhythm in order, you get some light on your skin, you know, your digestive system, your digestive health is highly reliant on sunlight. 
And most people don't realize that a lot of my issues that I had from my colitis, my dietary issues went away once I started spending more time in the sun, once I got a tan. Um, so I, I think that's a big and stress too. Like if you're under a ton of stress and you're constantly stressing, uh, your body isn't going to prioritize digestion, reproduction. It's going to steal a lot of resources away from digestion, from reproduction and, and put it towards, you know, stress hormones like cortisol. And so uh, once we get people to kind of chill out a little bit and then nurture themselves a little bit, get outside, eat more protein, everything starts to kind of snowball. And we usually start with one or two things with most people. You make a point of your number four here in the five tips of to slow down and chew your food. Yes, that's huge. We, we get a lot of people that have digestive issues go away when they actually sit down and relax, take a couple deep breaths. Mm. chill, be mindful, chew your food. And when you're mindful, you enjoy the food. It's more uh, satiating. And also mm. there's all sorts of things that happen in your mouth with the digestion of food, enzymes and things like that, that your body uses from your saliva to help break the food down. So if you're in a hurry to golf that down, one, you're not going to shut off your appetite. A lot of it's going to go right through you. Mm. And so getting people just simple, we try to really get the low hanging fruit first because we get a lot of people that are chasing shiny things they're chasing peptides or they're chasing HRT or whatever else. And they've done every supplement on the war on the books and they've never really had any long lasting results. And a lot of it is they just haven't done these, these five fundamental habits. They just, they haven't, it's just not part of their life. And if you don't have those, um, the chances of you having long-term success are greatly related uh, greatly reduced. That doesn't mean you can't use some of these tools, but a lot of people start chasing shiny objects instead of like, you know, looking like you're, you're a stress monster, you're working too much, you're doing too much. Um, you know, it's going to be really hard to get yourself in a better place if you're never stopping your car and doing the maintenance on it. Hmm. How much water should we be drinking a day? Well, that, that's going to vary person to person, but I like to tell people if you're, if your urine is Dr. Stillman has a height formula that confuses the hell out of me. I'm more of a, I'm more of a practical person. Stillman's more of a, uh, a, he's a science, very, he's a science guy, right? Yeah. So I'm a practical guy. I worked with a lot of high school You're athletes. So I, have, I have to give practical advice because, you know, when you're working with high school kids or whatever, I would just tell people, if your pee is super clear, you're drinking too much. If your urine is, is dark, you're drinking too little. Mm. And if your urine is kind of light yellow, then you're doing just right. right. So, and we usually recommend spring water. Um, if you can do that or reverse osmosis and we tell people to reconstitute it with, you know, cause the reverse osmosis pulls the good and the bad out. Right. Right. And so we, we, there's a, there's a product called concentrate. So you can get on Lord forbid Amazon. Um, and you just put two drops in eight ounces of water. Don't follow the instructions on the bottle. You'll feel like you're drinking a Metallica concert. If you do. Really? Um, you know, oh yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty harsh if you follow the instructions. But just two drops, and that'll help give you, you know, some of the magnesium, the calcium, and all the minerals that you need. It's interesting because I I'm in Western Florida, and the mm -hmm. Florida's got an issue with water, and so we have a reverse osmosis. And I uh, yeah. I didn't realize you can get so it's called concentrate. Yeah, concentrate. It comes in a little blue bottle. Concentrate. The Zephyr Zephyr Hills Springs is great water. Um, that's what we would use when we were when I lived in Largo. We would have it delivered to the house. Oh, you in Largo? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny they have that Zephyr Hills Springs Hill water here in Nicaragua. It's hilarious. Is that right? And at one of the grocery stores, I'm like, oh, this is crazy. So, yeah. And then your last one is lights off at night. It's important to be dark. So you you need light outside yeah. light, but you also need it. You need darkness when you sleep. Yeah, we need we need the two extremes, right? And so it's there's nothing. It's just like like training hard or working hard. There's nothing wrong with working hard or training hard. One, are you prepared to do it? And are you getting the opposite? Are you getting the, the light, the, 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 the shut it off? Paul Check um, had a wonderful uh, analogy of this. It's like, in order to work out, you have to work in as well. And it's just like, you have the bright light, you need the darkness. Your biology needs both. And mm -hmm. most people today are up till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock on Netflix. They're scrolling on their phone. Um, so they're not getting that the lights off at night. And we know, you know, night shift workers literally takes years off your life you Doesn't know it's, really. it's literally oh yeah i mean like 10 years off your life so we know that that you know and we know what 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 having artificial lights do to animals and nature 
And I think the combination of not getting any sunlight during the day, and, and most people don't realize if most of the bulbs today, the bulbs used to be incandescent, which had red in the bulb, which offsets, you know, it's like fire, you know, it offsets some of the side effects of blue light. And there's not, blue light isn't bad. It's just blue light by itself doesn't occur in nature. It's always accompanied by red and green and all these other colors. And it changes throughout the day. That's why it's so important to get outside because the sun is literally telling your body, you know, what hormones to produce, how to, how you regulate your immune system. All these things were information we're getting from the sun. So if you're sitting inside all day in front of a screen, you're basically getting this constant stream of blue light, which is basically making you more revved up and spiking your blood sugar and, and, hmm. you know, spiking stress hormones all day. And so the morning and the evening light is where a lot of red is. That's where a lot of the healing issue, if I tell people have not got out in the sun much, I tell them to start in the morning and the evening and then add a little bit of afternoon sun in. Whereas most, you know, most Westerners do the opposite. They don't spend any time outside in the morning and the evening to build their solar callus. And then they go outside at the hottest time of the day at the beach. And then they slather sunscreen all over themselves, give themselves a false sense of security. They wear sunglasses, which tell their brain it's nighttime. And so they don't produce a lot of the things that you need to produce to protect your skin. Hmm. Your brain's like, why do I need to produce these chemicals? I'm, I'm burning. My skin is hot, but it, my brain's telling me it's nighttime. So we, we, we send a lot of confusing messages to our biology. Hmm. And so that darkness is so important. Like having a dark, cool room is, is essential. And most people, if, you know, I tell people if they can't, if they have to do work on the screen later in the evening. You know, I, you can set your screen red and then you can also get blue blocking glasses. And that usually really helps people. Once they put those dark blue blockers on, they literally get tired. Like here, the sun is so intense and so bright. By the time it's four or five o'clock, I'm starting to yawn. I'm ready to go to sleep. Wow. I'm usually asleep by, usually asleep by eight o'clock, nine. And then I wake up with the sunrise, which is five in the morning here. So. And how can technology help? I heard you talk about, you know, some of the wearables. I think you have one on. Yeah. I have one on as well. Yeah, yeah I, I got it. So uh, do, how how are they? Well, I, I like them. I like them personally. Some people in the quantum space kind of poo-poo them because they do emit like a little bit of green light. But I love Aura because you can put it in airplane mode. The nice thing, I can see people's respiratory rate. I can see their HRV. It, mm. it gives people like, hey, you're a little beat up right now. You might want to chill out a little bit. Most people are not aware of just how much stress they're under. Like I had a lady that had been to all the big doctors and done thousands of dollars worth of tests. And they're like, we don't know why you're having these problems, right? And Aura has a, has a how much daily restorative time do you get on a right. chart? And we went back for like six to eight months and she didn't have one minute of restorative time during the day. Huh. And so once she started making time for, you know, we, we started with three or four minutes and then we went to 10 and then 15. And once she started getting 30, 40 minutes of time where she was chilling out during the day, her issues went away. And then guess what? As she would call me, she says, I'm really struggling. I said, let's look at your data. Sure enough, she was ignoring her, you know, rest and chill time. And, um, you know, <laughs> so it's a great tool to kind of like, I'm, my self-awareness has gotten better, but I'm the kind of person like, I could be sleep deprived. I could, but if I have a job to do, I'm going to do it. Like, mm. you know, there's some people you give them, you, there's a forest, you give them an ax and you tell them to cut down two trees They get, you get done with the two trees and you're like, there's all these trees here and I've got an ax. I'm just going to cut them all down. Mm. So there's a lot of people that have that personality. Um, you know, particularly we have like mothers or have, you know, women have so many more responsibilities. Now they're expected to look good. They're expected to have a career. They're expected to be a mother you know, all these things. And so they don't have any time for themselves. And so we get a lot of women in the practice that are just exhausted. And we just have to tell them like, you've got to make time for you, or you're not going to be able to take care of your family. You're not going to be there for your husband. You're not going to be there for your kids. You know, so getting people to slow down and be self-aware. Uh, my good friend, Joel Jameson, who, who, who basically, he had a, had a product called BioForce, which was a, a heart strap monitor that would tell you, your basic HRV and HRV is basically your body's ability to handle stress. And, you know, he's got one now called uh, Opus. No, is it Opus? Morpheus. He's got one called Morpheus now. And, uh, but he's the one that really brought HRV into the fitness industry. And he worked a lot with MMA athletes 
and he he talks about it all the time. He's like, and, and Christian Thibodeau is a, a, a you know a strength coach that I interviewed, and both of them are like the most important thing you can do is teach your client to relax, because most people are just under this chronic stress, and it's it's like you know it just it just kills you over time. Um, you know when you work hard, you want to work hard, but then you want to b- work in periods of rest and relaxation into that. How often do you check your your aura ring, your results? I do, I leave it in airplane mode every morning when I get up. I put it on the on the little the charger and sync it and get the data and then let it charge for five ten minutes and then it usually charges to full. Um, and then I just take a look, brief look at it. I usually know more or less where I'm going to be, but it's good for me to see the numbers. And if I see things trending in the wrong direction, I'm like I got to make some change. You know, I got to really hmm. you know make some changes. I found that if you leave it like go for a couple of days, it had sometimes it'll miss a day. So I just every morning I just put it on the cradle and then I sink it and then I put it back in airplane mode. Um, and that's uh, you know, and a lot of people will say, well, like it's got a little bit of green light, and they'll say that'll affect your your sleep. But you know, a lot of people have to see the data in order for them to like be aware. And I, I'd argue like we've had tons of people improve their overall health because of the aura ring. I'm like. If these people aren't, you, you could tell them that they're overstressed, they're doing too much, but they need to see it, right? Yeah. And so if you go for, you know, 10 or 15 years, chronically sleep deprived, chronically stressed versus a little teeny bit of green light on your finger at night, I, I don't know. I don't think it, I, I don't think that the negative, I don't think that little bit of teeny bit of green light on your finger is going to affect you like not being aware of how stressed you are. I also have a wearable watch. And Jim, the thing is, sometimes they, they, I mean, I just checked, knowing this conversation, I don't check it every day, which I should, right. but I, the Aura Ring told me I had optimal sleep and my wearable watch said yeah. it was just fair. Yeah, I mean, it, some of the sleep data is really kind of inconsistent. Yeah. I'm not really, I'm not real. I'm just want to see trends. So at least if it's measuring consistently, we can kind of see if you're trending in the right direction or not. The big indicators for me are HRV, resting heart rate and respiratory rate. Those are the three that are the most important hmm. to me. And so, and, and I'm not a huge fan of the, most of the watches. If, if you wear a watch, make sure you put it in airplane mode. You don't want to have something broadcasting off your body all day. I, I like just, I like the fact you're using wired headphones, just like I am. People are wearing these freaking Bluetooth in their ears and they're microwaving their brains. Like they don't Hmm. realize like that broadcast is going through your head. Hmm. You know, I don't, I don't think that's going to, a lot of people might think I'm, you know, uh, being extreme, but I don't think that's a good idea. So um, uh, if I, if people, I tell people if they're going to wear an Apple watch, put it in airplane mode, you don't need a cell phone on your wrist. It's bad enough being close to you, like holding Hmm. it up to your head. That's terrible. You know, put your cell phone in airplane mode when you put it in your pocket, you know, use the speaker phone instead of putting it up to your head hmm. um, and then use wired. The wired headphones are going to be better than the than the, the Bluetooth. You mentioned HRV, so it's heart rate vulnerability. I didn't know much about this until I, you know, learned yeah, about you. Very, very, variability. Very good. So mine's, my average is four, 24 milliseconds. So what is it actually measuring? It measures your body's ability to handle stress and your body's ability to switch from like kick ass to rest. And 24 is not terrible. We see a lot of people with 10 and, you know, five and 10, but for somebody your age, you probably want to be shooting for 60 to 80. Wow. You you do that by one breathing less during the day. So putting the tongue in the roof of your mouth, slowing your breathing down and breathing through your nose all throughout the day. So you're Hmm. driving in your car, you're doing this interview, your mouth is closed, you're listening, you're breathing through your nose. So you bring the respiratory rate down. We do low level cardio, um, easy cardio, you know, preferably breathing through the nose most of the time, you know, good nutrition, good sleep, all those things raise HRV. Um, So we want to make sure that we get people doing those things to help basically make them more resilient so their body can handle more stress. Now, if you have a low HRV, that doesn't mean you can't go out and set a world record. Like I'm sure Michael Jordan, when he had the flu and and shot the lights out and had like 50 points or whatever in a playoff game, I'm sure his HRV was terrible that day, but that doesn't mean you can't like set a record or, or like break a record. It means that you're not going to adapt well to that stress. 
So your body's ability to adapt to that performance or adapt to the stressor is going to be less when your HRV is lower. And then if you're constantly driving and overreaching and you're not working on, you know, shutting the nervous system off and relaxing, eventually you're, you're probably going to run into trouble. So I'm going to monitor that more closely. I mean, this is part of the problem. So, you know, it's almost, uh, what did it say? Paralysis by analysis. I have all this Correct. data. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what, what right, the measures right. are, you know? Well, the data just tells us if we're going in the right direction, right? Mm. And we, we basically get people doing the basics. And we, we do this with, we have this issue in the medical practice with labs too. Um, you know, people want to see their labs and the labs will tell us a lot of things, but the basics are what change the labs, right? right? So if you do the basic fundamentals and then there's, you know, supplements and things we can add in to kind of speed the process up. But the data really doesn't change the fact that you're going to have to get outside three times a day. You're going to have to eat a protein at every meal. You're going to have to drink high quality water, get the lights off at night and have social connection, which is one that people forget about a lot mm. is that social connection part of it because we're, I think we're more connected now, but more disconnected than ever. Hmm. Uh, we don't have good personal inter inter interactions. It's all virtual, uh, which I think leaves a, a lot of people really lonely. Mm. Um, community is a huge part of your overall health and well-being. There's a one of my favorite books I always I gave to clients, particularly since I attracted a lot of older clients that were using statins, was The Great Cholesterol Myth. And they have a study in there where they studied this population in Pennsylvania that they didn't eat good. It was like kind of a mining industrial town. Um and they, a lot of smokers, a lot of drinkers. But the fact that their community was so strong was the thing that kind of offset all those negatives. And wow. they ended up having, they didn't have the negative health outcomes that a lot of other people did with, hmm. you know, while doing those activities. So social connection, having a purpose, you know, having a community is a big part of, of your health, right? So the, the data is just, the, the aura ring is like you look at it and if, if your respiratory rate's high, your HRV is low, your resting heart rate's high, that means you just need a little more active recovery, so to speak. And so I don't get overwhelmed with lab results or, and here's the thing, your physiology can change instantly. Mm. There's a really interesting story of an orthopedic surgeon who took his blood work first thing in the morning before work. And it was absolutely perfect. And then he took another blood draw that evening after he'd worked like a 12 hour day and done like six surgeries and you know, highly stressful day. And it was showed him that he was like borderline of a heart attack. Mm. You know, his blood work was terrible. It's mm. just like, if you took your blood work during the tour to France, it would be horrific. Mm. Right. And that's a mistake. A lot of people make is they'll do their blood work after a hard day of training or on a day they've trained really hard. And then their blood work is absolutely annihilated. Mm. So a lot of these hormone markers and, 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 you know, A1C is a marker over a long period of time, but a lot of these other markers are changing constantly. And we'll get people that'll change their entire regimen and get on a bunch of drugs just because of one bad blood test, mm. you know? So we make sure we want to see trends. And that's why the aura ring is great because we can look at data and see, okay, I'm trending down a little bit because I started this really hard training program, but what is it doing? Is it trending down for a while? And then am I coming back and starting to adapt and recover? If I'm working with a high level athlete, I might want to lower his HRV on purpose and beat him up a little bit in order for him to what we call super compensate. We might beat him up for a few sessions or a week or two and then basically allow and then back off and allow his body to come back and, and overcompensate and go the other direction. So, you know, it's just a way to see what's happening with your nervous system and with your biology so that you're not just guessing. Mm. There's also white coat syndrome, Jim, right? When people go to the doctors and they get yeah. certain things tested. And we, uh, we deal with that a lot with blood pressure. Um, mm. a lot of the people that have been told they have high blood pressure, once they start taking it like four times a day, they don't have it. They only mm. have high blood pressure when they go to the doctor. And that's a question I love to ask people is high blood pressure bad. Not if I'm chasing you with a machete, it's one, right. right. you know, but if you're trying to go to sleep, it is. So the, it's just the ability to, to turn on the blood pressure, dial it back. Just like food, you should be able to like skip a meal and not feel like you're going to die. And you should be able to eat like a chocolate cake. And not, I'm not saying you should eat chocolate cake all the time, but you should be able to have a piece of chocolate cake and not feel like you're going to go into a coma. That's mm. called metabolic flexibility and variability. It's the same thing with movement too. You should be able to do really high threshold things like lift heavier things. And you should be able to flow and do things like Tai Chi. And a lot of people get stuck on one side or the other. They lose variability and that's when they get in trouble. 
Resting heart rate, mine's at 49. That's great. That's, that's really good. good. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So you probably just need a little more like non-sleep deep rest type stuff where you're laying down in the afternoon, you're closing your eyes, you're taking a nice breath in through the nose, long exhale through the mouth, doing eight or 10 mm. breaths, mm. and then slowing down and just after that and just closing, you know, mouth, putting the tongue on the roof of your mouth and just slowing your breathing down and just trying to melt and relax. Or something like crocodile breathing where you're laying face down on a bed like this and you're breathing through the nose nice and easy. You shouldn't hear it. I'm a little congested for whatever reason today. Um, you shouldn't hear it. You take a pause and you do a long exhale, six to eight breaths. You're trying to get air into your low back and your chest and your upper back. Hmm. And then after that, you would basically take like 45 seconds to a minute and just slow your breathing right down. And kind of you'll feel yourself kind of relax and melt. I tell people that have a lot of tension in the traps in the neck. That if they feel that coming on, just put the tongue in the roof of your mouth, slow your breathing down, and that's going to allow those accessory muscles to kind of relax and chill and and bring your aura, like bring your, your energy down. When you start feeling that tension in your neck and traps, that means you're using those scalenes, the traps, the lats to breathe. It's, you know, those are there for emergencies. Uh, they're not supposed to be your breathing muscles. Your diaphragm and your pelvic floor are supposed to be the ones doing your breathing. And a lot of the, the issues with breathing come from the actual shape of the axial skeleton and the position that they're stuck in. So they're, they're stuck in a position where they can't get into the position of the pelvis and the rib cage being lined up. They'll either have their pelvis pushed forward or their pelvis will be dumped forward and their rib cage will be dumped forward. Wow. And so what happens is a lot of times what we do and I do is getting people into the opposite of where they're stuck so that they can find somewhere in the middle. Because if you can't get into this zone of apposition, you can't use your, your diaphragm and your pelvic floor as a breathing muscle quite as effectively and you end up having to over breathe. Hmm. So the shape of your structure plays a big role in the regulation of your nervous system as well. And most people, you know, I learned this from my, my mentor, Bill Hartman, who's a very, very smart dude. And your brain will hurt if you ever go look at him. But... Hmm. You know, he talks about dead guy anatomy, which is most physical therapy and the nat and and phys you know all the stuff in in the movement sciences is based on a cadaver on a table, which doesn't have fluid in it, essentially, right? We you know guts and fluid and air, all these fluids and and, and you know so the whole system is based on these hinges and levers, but when you add fluid and you add pressure to the system. It changes the way the body works. All of a sudden, it's not just hinges and levers. It's pressure where you can get air. You know, all these things matter. And, and most people don't take that into consideration. They don't understand how fluid and pressure, you know, govern the way your body manages its midline and its, its center mass. There's so many small things we could do, Jim, that help us. I mean, people think to be so healthy, it's expensive. It's to, you know, right. it takes so much energy, but there's just so many simple things that you're outlining yeah. here that just keep us healthy. Where do you stand sure. on intermittent fasting? It's a tool like anything else, but most of the people that, that work with us, uh, particularly women, don't do well with it. They come to us, they've been intermittent fasting for several years. They don't eat till noon. Uh, I found that protein, having a, a good whack of protein, a little bit of fat in the morning, you know, maybe half a grapefruit, depending on, you know, what time of year it is and, and where you live. Most women in particular do much, much better when they eat breakfast and, mm. you know, it kind of sets them for the day and re helps regulate appetite. It's a tool. I think it, it can be great cycled in from time to time, but I like, if you're going to intermittent fast, I'd rather people do it on the back end than the front end. Um, I like having them do it so that their breakfast is heavy, their lunch is moderate, and then their dinner is light. Mm. And they get that longer fasting window overnight. Because what happens is a lot of people during the day, they get so busy and they're rolling along and then they get to noon and they kind of they kind of don't have time to sit down and eat. They're eating in a rush. And then by the end of the day, they're struggling to get all the calories they need in. Mm. And then they might end up eating a little junk, overeating. And then if you're under stress all the time, if you're under a ton of stress, when you intermittent fast, your body uses cortisol. That's why you feel so good because you have this energy because that's coming from cortisol being produced. So if you're already overstressed, you know, like a lot of business people will use intermittent fasting. Um, if you're already overstressed, particularly women don't handle chronic stress quite as well as men do. We're designed to handle more chronic stress. That's why we die younger. Um, 
Hmm. But we found that basically if you're chronically stressed and you fast, um, that cortisol, it, it just, you're, you're, you're getting cortisol because you're restricting your eating. You're getting cortisol because you're stressed. You're burning up a lot of resources. And I just don't see it working well over time for most women in particular. So all these things have nuance to them and it might work for a season. And then all of a sudden it doesn't, it's just like vegetarianism or carnivore. You know, you might be, you might go vegetarian and it might give your body a break and you, you, you might be, you know, too acidic and eating more vegetarian pulls you away from being too acidic, but that might, you know, over time that has consequences and complications and you might need to eat meat, add meat back in, you know, you mm. can use vegetarian diet for certain conditions to help pull you out of it. Just like you can use a carnivore diet to pull you out of certain conditions. But then eventually, you know, carnivore people, they end up not getting enough potassium that, you know, because they're, they're not eating potatoes and things like that. And all of a sudden they end up with mineral imbalances or they're tired. So we'll see people that have been on these like extreme diets for long periods of time and they work for them uh, for a certain particular period of time and then they run into problems. So that's why we really like a really balanced approach. It's a great book called The Vertical Diet by a guy named Stan Efforting. It's very, very balanced. You know, it's like meat, vegetables, you know, spinach, peppers. Uh, you know, if you're trying to be a, like a bodybuilder type guy and you're trying to gain weight, it's like white rice and potatoes. If you're trying to like lose some body fat, it's more, you know, like root vegetables, like, you know, sweet potatoes, um, carrots, parsnips, things like that. It's very balanced. And so we really like a balanced approach. I think there's a, a argument to be made for seasonal eating. You know, if I was hmm. living like I, I kind of have the cheat code because I'm living near the equator and there's always fruits and vegetables, things growing. I think if you live in the northern latitude, if you live in Canada or if you live in, in you know, in places in the United States where it gets really cold in the winter, I think that would be the time to do your lower carb diet. And then the summer when there's lots of sun, you, you eat what's in your environment. Traditional mm. cultures generally tend to eat what's in their diet. They eat seasonally. We've gotten away from that. I think that's a very powerful thing. I think things need to work in seasons. Um, so your diet is going to change with your training goals. You know, if you're trying to put on more muscle, you're going to need to eat more protein. Uh, you're going to have to eat some carbohydrates because you need insulin to build muscle. And, um, you know, I think rotating and changing your diet over time you know, subtly is, is, is very, very important. But a lot of people get married to a certain particular diet and they'll die at the stake. You know, they'll die at the stake for the diet. They're like, they get so caught. It's almost like re religion, you know, so um, intermittent fasting can be a tool until, you know, everything works for a while until it doesn't. So mm. we have to find something that's best for you and that's sustainable and, um, and go from there. But some people pull it off and some people don't. Yeah. I've been doing it for a while and it's just, it's become the norm for me. Certainly there's times where I deviate, but, uh, mm -hmm. I just find that two meals a day, I do a lot of my own cooking. So, um, sure. you know, so I'm eating, Generally, people eat more healthy when they're cooked themselves, but I just that's find two, two meals a day are, are, is, is okay. And if that's what, working for you, great. Yeah. Where should coffee be in the diet? Well, you want to push your coffee off. Most people don't understand how caffeine works. So caffeine is a wonderful tool. The problem is, is the more you use it, the less it works and the more you need. Huh. So when, when you drink coffee, what it does hmm. is it blocks a certain receptor in the brain which makes you sense being tired. So what do you think your body uh, does? It makes more tired, more of these receptors, right? So you have to drink more coffee to get the same effect. And that's why like energy drinks and things like that are an incredible business model because you have to continue to drink more and more just to break mm -hmm. even, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna, you know, Huber, Huberman talks about this. If you're gonna drink coffee, don't drink it first thing. Wait a couple hours, let your body kind of clear out and then you won't have that afternoon crash. And um, I, I enjoy coffee. I just have to make sure that I'm not using the coffee to prop me up because I haven't gotten enough sleep. A lot of people will like, they're sleep deprived, they're exhausted. They'll use energy drinks, coffee. They'll use, um, you know, pre-workout uh, to try and make up for the fact that they aren't rested. And mm. then they end up digging themselves a hole. So a lot of the people we, we work with that have gotten themselves in a bad place, like one lady I worked with, um, she had a coffee maker right by her bed and she couldn't get out of bed without a coffee. Wow. So we would have her go out in the sun. We'd have her take a cool shower. We'd have her do some light exercise to kind of get her body to produce cortisol. 
instead of using the port, the, 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 co the coffee to produce it. Um, and you know, she ended up doing much, much better. Um, you know, once we got her doing that, so I would push it off till eight, nine o'clock. If you can, it'll actually work better that way. And then I would take breaks from it like anything else. You know, I try to reduce my coffee consumption at certain times. And then like today, you know, I needed, I needed to be, I mean, it's still early here. So I needed to be a little more cognitive and alert. So I went and swam in my pool. I got out in the sun. I had a little, I have a little bit of coffee right now while we're talking. And it ends up working better if you use it strategically uh, than if you use it constantly all the time. So it's a tool mm. like anything else. You just have to be aware the more you use it, the less effective it's going to be and the more of it you're going to have to drink to get the same effect. Hmm. You know, Jim, I've never had a cup my whole life. Oh, so. Wow. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I wonder how caffeine would, would you know, I don't drink any of those energy drinks or anything, but good, I wonder how good. it would. So how about sugar? I mean, sugar. Um, many uh, Americans are addicted to sugar, whether they realize it yeah. or not. They're putting it into everything we eat, even sure. if it's the bad version. How, how should we really monitor our sugar? You just eat real food. I mean, yeah, that's really the answer. And you know, people go after these nutrients, whether it's seed oils or sugar or whatever. Mm. And they'll demonize them, but anything in, you can eat too much protein. You can eat too much fat. You can, you know, mm. anything in excess is going to be basically uh, a problem, right? So yes, the food companies are incredibly efficient at evolutionary biology and nutrition science. Mm. They know exactly the right combination of tastes and flavors that make you want to eat things to excess. You know, I, I heard of a guy talking about taking one of his clients and saying, I want you to eat as many things of Pringles as you can. <laughs> and he's like, he ended up with like six or seven of them he ate in a sitting, which is like an insane amount of calories. Six or seven containers? Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh I want my you goodness. to eat as, as many as you could. And he said, even when I was like getting to the point where I was full and sick, I still wanted to keep eating more because yeah. the taste is so satisfying. Right. Yeah. And then he's like, Okay, I want you to try and eat as many chicken breasts as you can. <laughs> and he can only do like three, right? And so, you know, these hyper palatable foods are designed, like, for example, if you're eating a tub of ice cream, which actually ice cream I don't think is terrible, particularly if it's full fat, because it actually is giving you enough fat that it actually, you know, shuts your appetite down. But like these people that do these eating contests, they'll eat ice cream. And then when they start, their appetites are slowing down, they'll eat like French fries with salt. Because that overrides oh. the uh, satiety response, and then they can eat more ice cream. So a lot of these companies, like 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 Doritos and things like that, they're designed to have all the tastes of like nutrient density. So your brain thinks it's getting this highly dense nutritional food, hmm. and then you get done eating the whole bag, and the body does inventory and says, "Wow, I ate all that food, but I don't have any of the minerals <laughs> and the nutrients that I need. <laughs> I need to keep eating to keep to find what I need." Right, so. Um, you know, that's why gorillas have to eat all day and they have to eat their own gorillas, eat their own feces. Most people don't understand that because they can't get enough nutrition. They can't make B vitamins from the, the food they eat. So they have to get it from their feces. So gorillas literally spend like their all whole day eating um, because they're eating foods that don't have a lot of nutrition in them. So when you're eating you know, foods that are empty of nutrition, it's much harder for your brain to shut it off because it's like, I'm missing all these things. I need to find more food. And the food industry knows that. The food companies know that. They know the right yeah. combination of things. I was actually looking at a thing the other day. Somebody had posted on Instagram. It was like French fries in like 1955 versus, you know, 2024. And it was like, the ingredients was like potatoes, tallow. Like that's when they cooked them in tallow, beef fat mm. and salt. salt. And today yeah. the, li the list was oh. like, it was like 50 things in there. So if you eat whole foods, if you eat good stuff, um, you stay away from like your candy bars and stuff like that. It doesn't mean you can't have an indulgence. I tell people if they are going to have an indulgence, you know, like a Snickers bar or, or they're going to have a pastry or something like that. Do it after you lift weights. Do it after your training session because hmm. you're going to, you know, your body's going to soak up all that glucose. That would be the time to do it. Um, but the rest of the time, 80, 85% of the time you should be eating, you know, chicken, steak, fish, vegetables, root vegetables, things like that. And um, you're going to come out ahead, you know, and obviously liquid calories, particularly people that are trying to change body composition. They'll be like, well, I have four protein shakes a day or three. And, then, and I'm like, 
you're just going to be ravenously hungry because protein shakes don't shut off your appetite. Mm. Right. So pulling liquid or protein bars have a, it's basically a candy bar and people, there's nothing wrong with having a protein bar from time to time if you're in a pinch, but if you're trying to change body composition, eating, you know, several protein bars a day, or we get people that eat handfuls of nuts, they're like pounding almonds or cashews or whatever. Mm, mm. And it's just like, we got to, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a tiny, tiny, like, you know, little bit of almonds, a little bit of nuts. We don't want to be eating the whole bag. Right. You know, so getting people to be self-aware, getting people to um, understand quantities and, and uh, slowing down and eating and then understanding that, I think the biggest thing that most people don't understand is we are designed to eat as much as possible and to move as little as possible because in the past mm. food was very scarce and we had to work really hard for our food and our survival. We had to build shelter. We had to do manual labor every day. You know, think about the amount of work you'd have to do if you're living in Alaska in a cabin, you know, the hunting, the fishing in the summer, in the winter time, you're having to find enough wood, you know, to keep yourself from freezing to death. You're constantly having to work um, and food is very scarce. So when you came across food, you ate as much of it as you could. But now we've got an abundance of calories on every corner, uh, very easy calories. Um, and we just, it, it just goes totally against our biology. And then we're not doing any manual labor at all. And then we try to make up for it by going to the gym um, and, you know, high intensity workouts a couple times a week doesn't make up for sitting on your ass all week. Hmm. Um, we've got more gyms now than ever. Right. And, uh, more obese people than ever. If you look at like the fifties and the sixties, like beach pictures, there was nobody was overweight. They spent most of their time outside. Hola. My, my cleaning lady arrived. Um, so, you know, they spent most of their time outside. Most women didn't work out at all, but they were active. They were cleaning the house. They were doing stuff. Um, working out for women was kind of like, counterculture at that time. Marilyn Monroe was really one of the first people to actually start lifting weights. And so now we've got all these people exercising and the obesity epidemic is is off the chart. So they're trying to make up for a, a crappy lifestyle, a crappy environment with exercise. And it just doesn't work very well for most people. Mm. You know, to your point, Jim, if I have a cookie, I want more cookies. Whereas if That's I right. have an apple, I don't want another apple. I mean, I'm done. You know, and uh, your body just knows you're talking about French fries to to try to get the ingredients of McDonald's French fries. You have to dig real deep, but there's over like 60 ingredients. And Europe who seems to be doing a better job at nutrition. They we yes. can't they can't sell the American French fries there. They have to get rid of a lot of those things that are just banned in a lot of, in those countries. It's it's yeah. um it's disturbing. You mentioned Andrew Huberman earlier. Are you a big follower? Yeah, I follow Andrew. I really like what Andrew's done with bringing the light to the light, so to speak. And really, there was only like Dr. Jack Cruz and like um, T.S. Wiley were the really, you know, when I first got into this circadian rhythm thing, that was really the only people that were really talking about it and making it aware, making people aware of it. And now you got Uberman out there who's making people aware of it um, and telling people how important it is to get outside and get in nature which I think is great. He's got a huge platform. So uh, I appreciate what he's done because, you know, people thought I was insane. You know, when I've been talking about this for well over 10 years, people looked at me like I was nuts. And now you've got this guy who's considered a legitimate scientist who's preaching the same thing. So I think it's, it's going to help a lot of people get them going in the right direction. But I think that's very powerful. Just getting your circadian rhythm, do an experiment, go onto Google and type in circadian rhythm in cancer, circadian rhythm in heart disease, circadian rhythm and whatever jock itch whatever you want to put um you're going to see a huge connection a huge link between the two uh, vitamin d deficiency as well so getting people outside we've been told the sun is so bad for us um you know we've we've evolved with the sun for however many years you believe so you know that light bulb has only been around for what just over 100 years so um <laughs> my 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 money's on the sun and uh, I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing today has a big part to do that we're living in an alien environment, essentially light that doesn't exist in nature. Mm. So, Jim, I started my business uh, in the 90s. Like I was working way too hard. I was not, it was 14 hour days. You're very familiar yeah, yeah. with the stress level when you were the coach. And 
staying yeah. inside and eating improperly. And before you know it, I, I got myself up to 340 pounds. Wow. And the, the doctor said to me, you know, if I don't lose the weight, I'm mm -hmm. not going to see my daughter graduate. My daughter was just born. I have a very comfort, a casual relationship, a comfort, comfortable relationship with my doctor. And so I'm driving home, Jim, you know, punching the steering yeah. wheel. What have I sure. done? This, it's, this is my pie hole, right? It's no, it's nobody's yeah. fault. I got myself here. So I spent the next six, seven months, changed everything I did, lost 130 pounds. And, you know, I kept it off. You, many people look at it like a finishing line. I lost all the right. weight and now I can go back to where I was, you know, but you, you've got right. to keep that change. So people want a quick answer. What's your secret? Like there's some secret, like, you know, I, I always say, here's my secret discipline. That's how I lost the weight. A willpower, a routine, a restraint, mm -hmm. control. That's how I lost the weight. I wonder how discipline plays a role in your life, Jim Laird. Well, I, I really, discipline takes a lot of effort. The willpower, which most people, it waves. Here's the thing. Once you get your body healthier, it's going to be easier for you to follow a regiment. That's why we start with a few things. And we want to build these habits so that they become what you do and who you are. Um, and it just happens naturally. Like I get up when the sun comes up and I just go outside. There's no effort. There's no willpower to it. There's like, it's just what I do. And we, we got to get people to fall in love with the process. If you look at the fifties and the sixties, People lived an outdoor life. They didn't spend all day inside. There was three TV channels. Like they didn't spend mm. all time and day inside watching TV. Their their life, the way our, their life was designed, was basically allowed them to to do as well as they did. Our lives are designed to give us the opposite now. Um, everything in our life pulls us away from nature. Pulls us away from a out, natural outdoor life. The air conditioning, like. In Lexington, I would laugh. It'd be the, it'd be like June. It would be beautiful, like 75, 80 degrees out. And you'd be at a restaurant, and I'd be sitting out front on one of the picnic tables by myself. And there'd be a line out the door of people that would be waiting to get inside and sit at a table indoors wow. on a beautiful day. You know, Europe, you don't see that. Most people still eat outside. Nicaragua here, you know, most I mean, all our restaurants essentially are outside unless you go into the capital city, Managua. But life in the past was this like people mowed their grass they were active outside the lifestyle we have today pulls us away from that outdoor lifestyle and so when we work with people it's about educating them on this is going to make you feel better this is going to give you if you're healthy it's going to be easier for you to make better choices if you're not in a stress response it's going to make it easier for you to not become a human vacuum cleaner so i think discipline is important but if you're not healthy and you feel like garbage, you're gonna. It's much easier for you to reach for that bottle of alcohol or mm. the bag of chips. Hmm. But if you're sleeping good, if they have all sorts of studies where they show that if your sleep is disturbed and you're sleep deprived, it's like you're drunk. It's essentially you're like impaired. So when you're impaired, you're not going to make as good a choice. Fascinating. So discipline is nothing without a foundation of health. I hope you season. can hear me okay. It started raining here. <laughs> I hear you just fine, but you're saying oh, that good. discipline, you need that foundation of health in order to have, in order well, to. Well, you need that foundation of habits. Uh, the habits, the process. You don't focus on the goal. And yes, there is some dis discipline involved, but you got to educate people on what the trade offs and the consequences of their actions are, right? So if somebody wants to change their body composition, you try to get them to think about, okay, is this meal going to take me more towards my goal or away from my goal? Is going for a walk going to help me or hurt me, right? Is going out with my friends and staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning, what is that going to do for me? Is that going to get me more towards my destination or further away? So people start making choices based on where they want to go um, as opposed to you know, I've got to get up and I've got to do this, or I've got to get up and I've got to do that. We get people to fall in love with the process because once you get out in the sun in the morning and you get that bright light in your eyes and you start getting outside during the day, you notice how much better you feel and you don't want to go back to feeling like garbage again. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons we're in big trouble because kids today are handed a phone and a screen at the age of two. And so they've got this, I remember when I was growing up, 
uh, in the in the late seventies, early eighties, and I spent all day outside, which I'm sure you did too, playing. Yeah. What would happen? How would you feel if you spent all day indoors watching cartoons all day? You felt like crap, you absolute sure crap. Now the kids today, that's the only, that's their baseline. They only yeah. know what it feels like to be in front of a screen. So they don't have any idea of what it's like to be outside and to be playing outside. The average uh, kid today, uh, maximum security prisoner gets more time outside than the average child today. Hmm. So these kids don't know what it feels like to feel good. And that's why they're reaching for all these, you know, sugar. And then parents are giving their kids Red Bull and all sorts of crazy stuff. The amount of kids I saw in high school that were drinking energy drinks and stuff was insane. Like, mm. there's no way I needed an energy drink when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16. I needed a sedative. I was so wired, mm. you know. So it's um, it's a weird world we live in. But, you know, we got to get people out of the, the loop of the tech addiction, the loop of the indoor lifestyle, and get them going outside and getting them to – uh, embraced having some silence, and then it becomes almost effortless. I don't think most people realize how easy it is once you eat real food, that you train, you strength train three times a week, and you're active every day. That's going to make a massive shift in people's health. People think they have to train like Rocky Balboa, or they have mm. to do CrossFit, or they have to do Navy SEAL boot camp in order to be healthy. No, you don't. You, you don't have to be training like a professional athlete. Actually, you know, most of that stuff is not ideal for your long-term health. So I think people get confused. They think that they have to do this. Like a lot of people look at it and go, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do hours of cardio. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do all these hit classes. No, lift some weights, go for walks, eat real food, you know, get your, get your sleep. And most people are going to see significant improvement just from that. Yeah, you need your health. You need your health to do anything. Jim, what motivates you? I love helping other people. Um, mm. that, that's really, if I can if I can inspire somebody else to just, I don't try and change anybody's mind. I really just want to make people think, right? And I want them to come to their own conclusion. Um, I really love helping people to the point where I probably help people too much. I've mm. gotten better at that. Like I would go to the gym and I'd be like, hey, can I help you with that? I sit back a lot more. It helps when you don't speak the language where you live. <laughs> um, but I, I love helping other people. And I love using my experience to kind of relate to people and help them, give them, I mean, most people, most coaches, I don't think do a really good job of bringing the, I guess, the prescription down to the level of the client. What happens is most people are like, okay, I'm in Tampa and I want to go to Los Angeles and I'm going to drive. I'm going to start in St. Louis. Most people say, I'm going to start in St. Louis. Or I'm going to start in Kansas City. They don't start in Tampa. And so lowering the level of what hmm. the prescription is to the level, like I had a lady yesterday that I talked to who's in Chicago, who's an attorney, and she literally spends 12 hours a day in front of the computer. She's got migraines. She's not doing very well. She doesn't know anything about this stuff. We started her with just getting outside in the morning for 10 minutes getting outside for five minutes around noon, getting outside for five minutes, rolling her window down a little bit on the way home from work, and then adding a protein. And then I gave her one, one breathing drill to do because I know she's overwhelmed. She's got this high-pressure job. I have to give her something she can actually do and complete. A lot of people throw too many things on people's plates. And guess what? She starts getting outside a little more. She starts eating a little more protein. She starts doing some relaxation drills. She starts feeling better. And then we can build some momentum and I can give her a few more things. But I might just have her do those through two, two or three things for like three months until they're like ingrained in her. And then I'll have a follow-up call. How are your basics going? How's everything going? If she's doing really well, I might add one more thing. But I think a lot of people try to change too many things at once and then they don't, they don't end up doing any of them. I really like what you said, how you don't try to change minds to all too often, Jim, in our society, in this environment, especially here in the States. It's very polarizing. People dig in and, you know, I, 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 I retain the right to change my mind on any given topic, given yes. evidence. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine a society 
where uh, where that would be the case. But yeah, you know, helping people like that, the, that that situation where that woman there in Chicago in front of a, you know, a high productive person, office person in front of a computer 12 hours a day, there's just some simple things that they can do that can really, really help them. And I'm so yeah, glad. And then, it's, then it's up to them to decide how far they want to take it. Mm. You know, um, not everybody needs to be an Amish person or move to the equator or, you know, that's totally up to you. Once you get yourself to a point where you're in a good place, then it's up to you to decide how far you want to take it. And then once you get in a good place, you know, how much can I get away with? And that's up to the individual. And that's about me as a coach, educating them on trade-offs. But we really want our clients to be resilient. A lot of people, they get so crazy with the dietary restrictions and stuff. Uh, they'll go out to eat somewhere and they're worried about everything that's in the food. And it's like, if you're resilient, you're in a good place. You should be able to go out and eat something that isn't quite as ideal and be okay, you know, not have massive digestive systems, uh, uh, issues or have, you know, reactions or things like that. We want, we want to build resiliency and we do that through fundamental habits over time. So that if you do decide to, you know, have kick your heels up and have a good time, it doesn't turn into a disaster. Hmm. So given the motivation, Jim, that, you know, helping others impact is your motivation, how do you measure success? I measure success by, by um, I, I understand that not every client is going to basically adhere to what I have to say or the advice that I've given. I might not be the right person for them at that time, or they might hmm. not have suffered enough. So I just, I just put the information out. I tell them what I think. And then I look at, you know, um, how they progress, but I don't get my, I don't get my self worth in getting results with people. I kind of like, I look at it like, if somebody does really well, great, good job, that's awesome. You did the work. I'm more of a mentor, and I understand there's going to be a certain percentage of people that are going to do really, really well. There's going to be a certain percentage of people that are going to do moderately well. There's going to be a certain percentage of people that are going to fail regardless of what I do. Hmm. So I don't, I know I'm, I know I have value. I know that there's people that care about me regardless of how successful I am. I just try and live every day and treat others the way I'd want to be treated. But I make sure I don't own the success of my clients because that's a recipe for disaster. Because if I base my success on what somebody else accomplishes. I'm also going to be totally devastated when somebody doesn't fail when somebody fails. Mm. And I've had plenty of clients that have come to me and worked with me and then they've gone somewhere else or they've gone off on their own and they contact me like three or four years later and they go, you know what? You were right about everything you told me. I just wasn't ready at the time. Mm. And finally that little voice in my head clicked and I started doing the things that you told me and now I'm doing much better. So honestly, I judge success if I can get people to think for themselves and if I can just, just challenge people to think in a different way. And, uh, you know, I've had enough people come back to me and say, hey, you really made a big difference in my life. Great. That's wonderful. But I don't that's not like how I hang my hat on uh, my self-worth. I think a lot of people. Uh, I just kind of roll with the punches and I do what I think is best and I let the results kind of happen on their own. And I, I don't assess over, well, this client didn't do what I said and they, they failed or there's so many different factors. I'm just a mentor. I'm a guide. And, um, that's kind of how I judge my success is just helping, helping people think different, helping people fall in love with the process. And really in the end, it's them, it's, they, it's, they do the work. It's me that just guides them. And a lot of what I do Basically, when I guide people down a certain path, all of a sudden they, they go, wow, I, I we're in a group coaching call and we'll be talking about something and somebody in the call will go, I never thought about that. That's something I need to address. Mm. So my, my job is to plant the seeds and then the, the good Lord or nature or whatever is responsible for those seeds growing. Not all the seeds are going to grow, but my good, my job as a coach is to bring the level of what I'm trying to put across to people to that client 
So they have a greater probability of success. So I really judge myself on how the people in the middle, getting them to shift, you know, to the right. And then some of those people that are going to fail, if I can pull a couple of those out of the failure into the moderate, then I think I've done a, a really, a really decent job. Well, Jim, I, I love what you're doing. I love your message. We need more people like you helping people. I mean, there's all too often where people are just going to prescription drugs and, the, you know, they're, yeah. they're trying all these things when there's just such simple things, just the foundations that we outlined in this discussion, getting sun, getting sleep, you know, good yeah. nutrition. It's just, it's, it's so simple and everybody can do it and we'll all benefit from us. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Anybody listening, how can they get in touch with you? Well, you can go to stillmanwellness.com. That's our main website. I have a YouTube channel. I also have, um, we have a quick start guide. If you go to stillmanwellness.com backslash quick start, basically a little quick start guide. You get on our email list. Um, I have an Instagram. It's actually G-Y-M, uh, Jim Laird, G-Y-M, L-A-I-R-D. Never name a gym after yourself. Not a good idea. It kind of did a play on words. Um, it's not good when you go to sell it. Um, but Instagram, YouTube, I'm on there as well. Uh, we actually do a really cool thing every week where we do like an in-depth webinar on Thursdays. And if you get on our email list, we send you a link to that webinar on Wednesday night so that you can you can sign in and watch it live. You can ask questions. We do it off of the, the social media platforms because a lot of times, um, a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we say on YouTube or Instagram might get censored or pulled off. Mm. I, I will say the key, one of the keys to helping others is helping yourself first. Mm. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I'm able to help people is because I've destroyed my health in many different ways, but Sunday. And so that that's kind of my way of like, okay, I've struggled with this. And hey, maybe I can help you not you know, to hit the tree and crash the car before you make some changes. So just giving people information, making them aware so they can choose for themselves is really what I'm all about. Well, Jim, thanks so much for your time. If uh, I make myself down there, my way down to Nicaragua, perhaps we could have a cup of tea and enjoy it. That'd nice be great. Swim. If you ever come down here, uh, let me know. I can tell you where to go, help you with logistics, all that stuff. It's a great, great country. It's very reasonably priced. Um, and it's only it's only a two-hour flight from Miami. So, mm. Very cool. Jim, thanks so much. You be well. Have, a, have yourself a great day. You too, man. Don't forget to get outside. I will. I will. I will most certainly. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Podcast information, the video version of our podcast is on YouTube. Please subscribe. Audio is on all major podcasting platforms. Please follow them. And if you like it, please consider giving five-star rating. Would really appreciate that. Thank you again for listening or watching. Joey Pins Discipline Conversation.